All right, I'm going to read from a second reading from Holy Sihia, The Stillness That Knows God, um, a defense of the Holy Hesychastic Book 1 by uh, St. Gregory Palamas. Uh, I read from the last part of Section 1, and this part of Section 2, um, St. Gregory is going to be answering this question, uh, and essentially the question boils down to the kind of Gnostic idea of the body being evil. And they're going to be exploring the role of the noose. So the noose is essentially the spiritual discerning part of the psyche. Um, the the uh, Orthodox situate this part of the psyche in the heart. And they're going to be talking here, the Gnostic or the kind of Hellenic tradition, um, secular tradition. We can think of the term Hellenic here just as secular, philosophical, postmodern in terms of our current context, our modern context, he was writing this in the 13th century, I believe it was. Um, yeah, I think that's right. So yeah, it's, it's just as relevant today, if not more, talking about the way to situate uh, secular philosophical thought uh, within the uh, holy tradition here. Let me see if I'm off in my date. Yeah, I think that's about right. So here's the questioner he's going to be asking, and we're going to get into some really great um, exegesis of the holy hesychastic tradition in terms of the noose, right? Again, the noose is your spiritual part of your psyche, the divine part of your psyche. The Gnostics held that it was um, outside of the body because the body is evil. And uh, Palamas here is going to be quoting from the scripture a lot from Paul talking about how uh, the body in itself is not evil, but it is um, kind of been um, it's kind of been uh, harbingered by the wicked one. Uh, so here we go. Here's the question. I'm going to read a little bit down here. It says, I ask you now, Father, to hear my explanation of each of the other arguments which I have understood are put forward by these men who spend their lives occupied with Hellenic education. I also ask you to tell me whatever you judge best about them and to add the opinion of the saints on the subject. These people say, in effect, that we are wrong when we wish to confine our noose within our body. Instead, they say we must, at all costs, shift it out of our body. They severely criticize some of our people and write against them under the pretext that our people encourage beginners to look into themselves and to introduce their noose into themselves by means of breathing practices. They say that the noose is not separate from the psyche. So how can we bring into ourselves something that is not separate from us but is part of our psyche then they add that these friends of ours speak of introducing divine grace into themselves through the nostrils but i know that this is an attempt to malign us for i have not heard our people say anything like this i must conclude that their conduct is equally misleading in other areas since those who make false accusations also distort reality so, Father, please teach me. Why do we try so hard to bring our noose into ourselves? Why do we not think that it is wrong to confine it in our body? Now, here's the answer from Palamas. A really wonderful material here. All right, so he says, Brother, have you not heard that the Apostle says, Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in us? And also ye are the temple of God? For God himself says, I will dwell in them and will walk in them and I will be their God. Then why should anybody who is endowed with a noose think it improper to bring their noose into a body whose very nature it is to be the dwelling place of God? How then would God have caused the noose to inhabit the body in the first place? Was he also wrong? The truth is, brother, that these words apply more properly to those heretics who claim that the body is an evil thing made by the wicked one. As for us, we believe it is a bad thing for the noose to be caught up in the corn in carnal thoughts. But it is not in itself wrong for the noose to be in the body, since the body is not evil. This is why those who joined to God with their life cry out to God with David. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, and my heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. And with Isaiah, my bowels shall sound like a harp for Moab, and thou hast renewed my inward parts as an earthen wall, 
And also, we have conceived, O Lord, because of thy fear, and have been in pain, and have brought forth the spirit of thy salvation. Continues, because we trust in this spirit, we will not fall. It is those who speak the language of here below who will fall, those who say falsely that the words and life of heaven are just like those on earth. For if the apostle too calls the body death in these words, who will deliver me from this body of death? It is because material and corporeal thought really takes its form from the body. Accordingly, to contrast it with spiritual and divine thinking, he rightly calls it body and simply and not simply body, but body of death. A little earlier we had shown more clearly that he does not accuse the flesh itself, but that sinful desire which overcame it later because of the fall. I am sold to sin, he says, but he who is sold is not a slave by nature. And again, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwelleth. He does not say, do you see, that it is the flesh which is evil, but what dwells in it. What is evil is not the fact that the noose lives in our body, but an evil power. The law which is in our members, which struggles against the law of my mind. So that's situating the question of the, the noose against this Gnostic idea of the body is inherently evil. And this part of the section here. He talks about over, overcoming the law of sin and gives a wonderful distillation of the kind of patristic understanding of how to uh, appropriately situate uh, this, the noose in the psyche over the control of the body and the mind. Uh, and it's just wonderful here. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. This is how we overcome this law of sin. We expel it from the body, and in its place we introduce supervision by the noose. And by this authority, we bring, we bring each power of the psyche and every member of the body that responds to it under the rule of the noose. For the senses, we determine the object and the scope of their actions, and this work of the law is called self-control. From the passionate desiring part of the psyche, we obtain the best state of being which bears the name of love. We also improve the rational part by eliminating all that prevents the thoughts from turning towards God. The part of the law we name, this part of the law, we name watchfulness. So one who has purified his body by self-control, one who by divine love has made his willfulness and his desires a mean of virtue, one who presents to God a noose purified by prayer, then receives and sees in himself the grace promised to those whose hearts are pure. He can then say with Paul, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of, no of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But he says, We have this treasure in earth earthly vessels, earthen vessels. In consequence, in order to know the glory of the Holy Spirit, we carry the light of the Father in the person of Jesus Christ in earthen vessels, that is to say, in our bodies. So will our noose be without nobility, if we too keep our own noose within the body? Who could argue with this, save man who is spiritually asleep, and whose noose is without divine grace? All right, on to the next section. He says, the psyche is one, yet it has many powers, and its natural instrument is the body which is given life in accordance with the psyche. But what instrument does the power of the psyche, which we call the noose, use when it is active? Nobody has ever supposed that the noose resides in the fingernails, in the eyelids, in the nostrils or the lips. Everyone agrees it is found inside of us, but some hesitate to be specific. Some claim the noose is primarily in the belly, and some place the noose in the brain, as in if a kind of Acropolis. Others consider this that its vehicle is the very center of the heart, the place within the heart that is free of natural breath. With this, we agree and can also say from exact experience that our reason is not inside us as if in a container, 
because it is incorporeal, nor is it outside us because it is part of us. So the natural organ of the noose is the heart. And we learn this not from man, but from the very creator of man, who taught, it is not what enters, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. Saying further, those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. Macarius the Great did not say otherwise. The heart directs and governs all the other organs of the body. When grace endows the heart, it rules over all the members and all the thoughts. For there in the heart, the noose abides as well as all the thoughts of the psyche and all its hopes. So our heart is the seat of reason and the primary organ of the power of the noose. Consequently, as long as we seek to monitor and rectify our reason by strict watchfulness, how else would we watch it if we do not gather our noose back within, scattered without as it is by the senses? How, co how could we monitor our reason if we did not bring it back to the interior of this same heart that is the seat of our thoughts. This is why Macarius, Macarius so justly called the blessed immediately goes on to say grace itself writes upon their hearts the laws of the spirit. Where? In the governing organ, the throne of grace, where we find the noose as well as all the thoughts of the psyche, that is to say, in the heart. Do you see how how very necessary it is for those who decide to maintain watchful stillness to turn back their noose and confine it into the body and above all within the deepest part of the body which we call the heart if as the psalmist says the king's daughter is all glorious within why do we search search for her outside and if as the apostle says God sent forth the spirit of his son to cry in our hearts, Abba, Father. How is it that we too do not pray with the spirit in our hearts? And if as the Lord of the prophets and apostles teach the kingdom of heaven is within us, then whoever focuses the energy of his noose outside of himself, how could he not also find himself outside the kingdom of heaven? For the upright heart, says Solomon, seeks knowledge which he calls elsewhere noetic and divine. All the fathers who seek to gain this knowledge say that a spiritual noose is inevitably wrapped in spiritual understanding. Whether it is in us or not, we must never stop seeking this understanding. Do you see that if we desire to combat sin and acquire virtue, to find the reward of the struggle for virtue, which is noetic understanding, the pledge of that reward, we must bring the noose back into the body and into itself. The opposite, to look for noetic visions by making the noose go out, not only into sense perceptions, but out of the body itself, that is the greatest of the Hellenic errors, the root and source of all corrupt doctrine. Such doctrines breed stupidity and come from foolish presumption an invention of demons. This is why those who speak by demonic inspiration find they are beside themselves, not knowing what they are saying. As for us, we not only return the news to our body and into the heart, but also within itself. Then there are those who say that the noose is not separate from the psyche, but is interior to it. Consequently, they question how we can possibly recall it into ourselves. It seems that these people are ignorant of the fact that the essence of the noose is one thing, its activity another. Or rather, they are, all, they are well aware of this, but willingly side with the deluded and avoid the question. Such men sharpened to contradiction by dialectic do not accept the simplicity of the spiritual teaching. As, as the great Basil says, they invert the force of truth with opposing arguments of false knowledge aided by the persuasive arguments of sophistry. Such people judge themselves worthy to judge spiritual things and even teach them, even though they are not themselves spiritual. Do they not see that in fact the noose is not like the eye which sees other visible objects, but can see itself? The noose operates in one way, in its function of exterior observation, 
This is what the great Dionysus calls the movement of the noose along a straight line. It has another way in which it comes back to itself, then acts from itself when it becomes aware of itself. This movement, the same father calls circular. This is the most excellent and appropriate activity by which the noose comes to transcend itself and become united to God. For the noose, says St. Basil, when it is not dispersed, returns to itself and thereby ascends towards the contemplation of God, as if by an infallible road. Notice how he says dispersed. What is dispersed without therefore needs to be collected and abound within? Dionysus, the most reliable witness of the spiritual realm, says that this movement of the noose is not subject to any error. The father of lies always desires that people will be led astray by their own faults, abandoned the spiritual ascent, and so to fall into fulfilling his plan for them. Until now, as far as we know, he had not yet found a partner to take the lead in guiding others to this goal by fine talk. But now, as you tell me, it seems he has accomplices who have even written treatises towards this end and who seek to persuade men, even those who have em embraced the higher life of form of hesychasm, that it would be better to keep the noose outside the body during prayer. Such people do not even respect the clear and authoritative words of John, who writes in his Ladder of Divine Ascent, the hesychast is one who strives to confine his incorporeal soul within his bodily home. Our spiritual fathers have passed the same teaching down to us, and rightly so. For naturally, if the hesychast does not keep the inner life within the bounds of the body, if he makes a division on account of his natural form, if the outer and distinct is not properly aligned towards the essence of the noose, then as long as this natural form has life, the image of life, appropriate to the union of its parts, is not complete. You see, brother, how John Climacus has shown that it is enough to examine the matter in a human, let alone spiritual way, to see that when you decide truly to belong to yourself, to be in accord with the interior man, to be a monk who is worthy of the name, then it is absolutely necessary to recall and keep the noose within the body. On the other hand, especially with beginners, it is not appropriate to teach them to observe themselves and send their noose back into themselves by way of the inward breath. A man of understanding would not forbid the use of sure methods to bring the noose back within itself to someone whose attention wanders. Those who are beginning to undertake the struggle find that their noose escapes as soon as it is collected. It is therefore necessary for them to bring it back into themselves almost continually. In their inexperience, they do not realize that nothing in the world is more difficult to observe nor more mobile than the noose which is why certain teachers recommend controlling the inward and outward movement of the breath and holding it briefly. In this way, they will be able to hold their noose steady by watching their breath until, by the grace of God, they might progress, having withdrawn the noose from what is around it, having purified it, and in doing so, might truly become capable of returning to an, a unified recollection. At the same time, we can say that this control of, of the breathing is a spontaneous result of the attentiveness of the noose. The in and out movement of the breath becomes peaceful during intense reflection, especially in those who practice stillness in the body and in thought. In effect, people like this practice a spiritual Sabbath insofar as they cease all personal activity. They strip from the awareness of the psyche all changeability, all imagings, all imaginings, all sense perceptions, and in general, all voluntary activity of the body, even involuntary acts like breathing, are restrained as far as possible. For those who have made progress in hesychasm, all this occurs without painful effort and without the need to think about it. For the complete entry of the psyche within itself necessarily and spontaneously produces it. But with beginners, None of these things happen happens without struggle, as patience is a fruit of love, for love bears all, and we have been taught to practice patience with all our strength to come to love, so it happens in this also. But why say any more about it? 
Those who have experience can only laugh when contradicted by the inexperienced. Their teacher is not words, but work and the experience that comes from their own efforts. It is this last which bears useful fruit, and it is this which renders barren the comments of the critics. One of the greatest doctors teaches that, since the transgression, the inner man is a likeness of the outer. Thus, the man who seeks to turn his noose back into itself need not propel it in a straight line, but into the infallible circular motion. How will he not gain great profit in this, if, instead of letting his eye roam hither and thither, he should fix it on his breast or navel as a point of concentration? In this way, letting his posture take the outward form of a circle, he will not only collect himself, but will shape himself to the interior movement of the noose that he seeks to have his noose follow. In addition, by taking this attitude in his body, he will return the power of the noose, which otherwise drains out through the sight back into the interior of the heart. If the power of the animal intelligence is situated at the center of the belly, where the law of sin exercises its rule and is given pasture, why should we not establish there the law of the noose, which opposes this power armed with prayer? Then the evil spirit who has been driven away by the font of regeneration will not return to install himself there with seven other spirits more evil than himself, and so making the latter state worse than the first. Attend to yourself, says Moses, meaning to yourself as a whole, not just as a part while neglecting the rest. How? With the noose, evidently, for we cannot be attentive to ourselves as a whole with any other power. Therefore keep this guard over your psyche and body. It will easily deliver you from the evil passions of both body and psyche. So attend to yourself. Take a grip on yourself. Be aware of yourself, or rather, mount guard over yourself. Take command. Master yourself. For this is, how you will, this is how you will make the unruly flesh submit to the Spirit, so that, so that there will never again be a wicked word in your heart. In the spirit of him who rules, that is, the evil spirits and harmful passions rises within you, as Scripture says, do not leave your place. In other words, do not cease watching over any part of your psyche nor any member of your body. In this way, you will become impervious to the spirits that attack you from below, and you will be able to present yourself with confidence to he who tries the hearts and the reins, because you will have tried yourself, and as Paul says, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. You will then have the blessed experience of David, and will say to God, The shadows are no longer dark, thanks to you, and night for me will be as clear as day. For you have taken the possessions of my reins. In effect, David is saying, not only have you made all the desires of my psyche your own, but if there's a spark of desire in my body, it has returned to its source. It is bound to you by its origin, raised and united to you. Those who abandon themselves to sensual and corrupting pleasures exhaust the whole desire of their psyche on the flesh so that they become entirely flesh. It is then, as the scripture says, that the Spirit of God cannot dwell in them. But in the case of those who have elevated their noose to God and exalted their psyche through divine logging, their flesh too is transformed and elevated. Then it participates in the divine communion and becomes the dwelling and possession of God. It is no longer the seat of enmity toward God, and no longer possesses any desires opposed to those of the spirit. Between the flesh and the noose, what is the most direct link for that spirit which, rise, which arises in us from below? It is not the flesh that, as the apostle said, does not shelter anything good until the law of life has come to live in it. It is thus on account of this most powerful reason that we must never relax or focus on it. So how do we make sure that it becomes our own, so that we do not lose it? Unless we train ourselves in our external posture so as to keep watch over ourselves, how can we present the evil one 
prevent the evil one from rising up in us. We who do not yet know how to reject spiritual evil by spiritual means. And why speak only of novices, when the most perfect adopt this posture during prayer, and so attract to themselves the benevolence of God? Some of them lived after Christ, but others preceded his coming. Elias himself, the most perfect of those who had seen God, leaned his head on his knees and so with great struggle gathered his noose into himself, bringing to an end a drought of many years. So it would seem, brother, that those of whom you speak appear to suffer from this disease of the Pharisees. They do not wish to observe and purify the interior of the vessel, which is to say, their hearts. They disregard the tradition of the fathers and seek to take precedence over everybody like a new teachers of the law. Yet they themselves disdain the form of prayer that the Lord had commended in the, in the case of the publican, and they advise others not to practice this form of prayer. But in the gospel, the Lord actually said he didn't even dare to raise his eyes to heaven. Those who seek to turn their vision back into themselves in their prayer correctly imitate the publican. Some people call them armful of physics, intentionally maligning them as if they were adversaries. Yet who among them ever said that the psyche was in the navel? These people clearly use slander as a way of presenting themselves. More than this, they openly insult those worthy of praise while pretending that they are simply correcting their mistakes. It is not on account of the Hesychast, is it not on account of the Hesychast life or of the truth that drives them to write, but their vanity? It is not their desire to lead people towards watchfulness, but to lead them away from it. They endeavor by all these means to discredit the work of the watchfulness as well as those who devout themselves to it, finding an excuse for this in the practices which are linked to it. These people would be ready to teach that the laws of God is within the stomach, on hearing those who approach God exclaiming, My stomach resonates like a harp, and my innards are renewed as a wall of bronze, as if they too were celiophysics psychics. They slander without distinction anybody who employs physical symbols to represent, define, or study things that are noetic, divine, or spiritual. But the saints do not suffer at all by this. Instead, they receive praises and crowns without numbers in heaven. While these people wait outside the sacred veil and can do no more than ponder the shadows of the truth. One is deeply afraid that they will pay for this by eternal judgment, not only because they set themselves apart from the saints, but because they attack them with their words. Last page. You know the life of Simeon, the new theologian. Always from beginning to end has life. His life was a miracle, since God glorified him by means of supernatural miracles. You may also know his writings, and if you describe these as words of life, you are not at all mistaken. You, now, you know of St. Nicophorius, who spent long years in the desert in Nisihia, and later lived in the most deserted parts of the holy mountain, allowing himself no respite. It was he who transmitted the practice of watchfulness to us, having collected it from the writings of the fathers. These two saints evidently taught the practical method to those who have chosen this way, practices which, as you report to us, some people now oppose. But why speak only of the saints of the past? These men who testified a little time before us and who are recognized as having possessed the power of the Holy Spirit have passed these things on to us out of their own mouths. For example, that theologian called the true theologian, the most reliable of the witnesses of the real mysteries of God, was celebrated in our time. I speak of Theoleptos, the Bishop of Philadelphia, who was truly inspired by God, who illumined the whole world like a chandelier, and Athanasius, who for many years graced the patriarchal throne and whose tomb was honored by God, and Nihilus, originally from Italy, who emulated Nihilus the Great, Seliotis, and Elias, who were in no way inferior to him. 
Then there were Gabriel, Gabriel and Athanasius who had the gift of prophecy. It is about all these that I would speak, and about many others who were before them, with them, and after them. They encouraged and inspired those who wished to maintain this tradition. At the same time, these new teachers of hesychasm wish to admonish us, not from experience, but as part of their boasting, since they do not even know a trace of Isichia. These people seek to reject the same tradition, to distort it, to make it appear despicable, all without giving any benefit to those who hear from, who hear, who hear them. Speaking for ourselves, we have personally communicated with some of these saints, and they were our teachers. So what does this matter? Do we count as nothing those who have received the teaching of experience and of grace in order for us to bow before those who are given to teach only by their pride and their search for verbal dispute? They will not be, never. And you, keep yourself away from these people and apply yourself wisely to David when he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Let yourself be convinced by the fathers and listen to their advice on how to make your noose return within you. And the last part here looks like there's a little uh, prayer. The heart directs and governs all the other organs of the body. When grace endows the heart, it rules over all the members and all the thoughts. For there, in the heart, the noose abides, as well as all the thoughts of the psyche and all its hopes. So that is uh, part two. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a little long, but I uh, hope you guys are well and talk to you soon. God bless.